Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last but not least panel of the day for Lincoln's Reboot 2020. Uh, ironically, neither of these folks work in Silicon Valley, but we are going to roll with these amorphous titles either way. But we're really excited to bring a conversation on cities, data, and the sort of future in a post-COVID world. We're joined by Kelly Chin, who is the, uh, making sure I'm getting this right, the Chief Analytics Officer of the City of New York. We're also with Lillian Coral of the Knight Foundation, where she was previously the Chief Data Officer at, uh, the, at the city of Los Angeles under Mayor Eric Garcetti. I think the most immediate question is, what is the difference between a chief data officer and a chief analytics officer? Um, that's what I was trying to get right there, yeah. um, Lillian. <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, um, I can start, but um, I, I would say, I think in the chief data role, what we really tried to do in the city of Los Angeles is both focus on the open data program for the city, which was a big anchor for Mayor Eric Garcetti, who, who was, you know, I think one of the leading mayors who really focused on open data and transparency in the early stages of this movement. Um, and then we also really tried to focus on an analytics program and a digital services program, which is actually something I think we'll both dig into later today. So in that role, I think we were trying to encompass multiple different ways in which data is utilized in the city not just um, sort of, I think sometimes what traditionally we think of uh, or how we think of data being used as primarily like a performance measurement management tool. So that's how we did it at the city, but Kelly, how are you guys treating? Yeah, you know, we, uh, it, it's a great question. I think here in the uh, city of New York, we've gotten, uh, th this title predates me, the, the chief analytics officer and really was one that was written into uh, the legislation here. So in New York, we are very, a privilege that the data team and office are actually written into the city charter, which is effectively New York City's constitution, uh, even though it was by executive order at this point, I think about eight plus years ago. So part of this is is naming semantics and, and you know, you may call different uh, titles, different things in, in different cities. And I just wanna echo Lillian and uh, Los Angeles's great work over time, really thinking about data as asset. I think of that as uh, one of the key distinctions between a uh, chief data officer is really in charge of uh, uh, governance and, and maintaining data sets as assets. Not to say that I don't also do that as a part of my job, um, but we also have a, a team of really fantastic data scientists here in the city of New York. And one of my core uh, functions and my office's core functions is to deliver analysis. Uh, so we are the ones you call when you need a quick data analysis done or an agency um, may need work done. And that has certainly transpired uh, since March and, uh, and April for us. Uh, when COVID hit around pandemic analysis. Yeah, so I'm obviously not asking for political commentary here, but the thing that's changed between Friday, the first day of reboot, and today is obviously um, President, um, President-elect Biden became President-elect Biden. So is, is, as, as you're thinking about the city of New York and Lillian, as you're thinking about LA and your broader portfolio, how does a presidential transition or sort of this sort of process factor in the ways that cities are thinking about their challenges, especially during COVID? Would just love any general thoughts on that. Sure, I, I'm happy to start here. So I think first off, um, a lot of this comes down to funding for, for state and local governments and um, with the you know, President-elect Biden coming in in January, I think that is top of mind for not just New York City, uh, which uh, annual our annual operating budget is over 90 billion a year, uh, and we service 8.6 million New Yorkers. Um, but that is certainly first and foremost uh, in, in mind here. And then of course, there are many, many, many different policy areas um, that I believe folks are just starting to read more through uh, the transition website and the plan in terms of what the incoming uh, 46 administration's priorities will be uh, and what the, the analysis of kind of policy priorities here in New York City will be. Um, but yeah, definitely the dollars and, and the funding. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing. I was actually in my role in the city of Los Angeles during the last presidential transition um, to President Trump. And I think one of the biggest things that in hindsight, it's unfortunate because I don't think we've made much progress on it, broadly speaking, is 
Um, there still lacks a lot of understanding or clarity about governance of data um, as an asset um, to Kelly's point previously in terms of especially how cities um, manage that data, how they then share it with either the state or the federal government. And so I remember one of the first things that happened under President Trump's um, you know, first month in office was um, a lot of the executive orders around immigration. And the question became locally, how much data and information do we have to give to the federal government? Um, and how do we actually even have a full sense of how we as a city were managing that information? And I think we actually moved in the city of Los Angeles, there was a decision to move forward with an executive order around immigration um, that also included in, um, uh, a note, a stipulation around data sharing with the federal government. I would say four years later, I mean, I don't know that we're gonna have the same kinds of questions immediately in this administration, but I think for all individuals in these data roles, there's still a lack of clarity and this is, I think, where a future opportunity with an administration that may be open to data and tech and, and, and more active on it is, how do we start to really clarify as a country the governance structures of, of these um, municipal and, and, and civic data assets? Because we really don't have that. I think cities individually come up with executive orders or, or ways of managing information, but across municipalities, we still don't have um, the kinds of standards we really should as a country um, that we should have in place. And I think some states like California obviously are starting to put more of that with um, you know, privacy, um, privacy standards um, statewide, but we still really don't have that as a country and, and we really should. And so that's one thing I kind of think about from the last transition and, and wonder what would happen under this one as well. Yeah, thanks for pointing out the sort of opportunity framework because I think that's a good transition for us as we're sort of moving into this sort of three, four month agenda sort of setting period. Kelly, from a New York City perspective, what would be your priority areas that do relate to this broader sort of data as so like city analytics question for the federal government? And Lillian, like taking a sort of step back, how would you think about those broader set of opportunities in cities, not just merely with New York, obviously? Yeah, so you know, I, I think I can echo for um, in in alignment here in New York City and and every other jurisdiction. COVID, COVID, COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Our our priorities around data analysis, uh, data collection, integration, whether it is public health information, um, testing capacity here in the city, ensuring that New Yorkers are getting tested in the months to come. Um, and uh, in addition, any operational data. So I think what's super interesting is every time I talk about data, people immediately start thinking about public health data, but there's a lot of data out there that relates as proxies to COVID that have to do with government's response. So let's take as an example um, here in the city, feeding New Yorkers and food insecurity. There's a ton of data that we've been providing uh, and receiving based off the delivery of, at this point in the city, millions and millions and millions of meals that have happened over the last eight plus months. Uh, and so this type of data uh, from the very beginning was, uh, Lillian knows this, uh, very, very complex and manual to integrate a lot of those data streams, but it continues to be really important. And I think for those of you who are following, whether your jurisdiction is grappling with a second wave or a third wave, it is even that much more important that by now, hopefully, you've stood up the data infrastructure um, and that that information flowing into decision makers and policymakers' hands are helping now as we head into winter time, do a better job of making uh, more tailored decisions. And I think this goes back to, Marshall, your questions around uh, incoming federal administration. I would love to see more intelligent investments from the federal government literally directly injections into data infrastructure and data integration, because this is a constant, whenever there's an emergency, we're, we're always running around trying to figure out how can we do a better job here? And oftentimes it is still a, a need for funds there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I echo everything Kelly says. And the only thing I would just add is, I think I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that any administration coming in um, you know, whenever we have a transition of power, always thinks about, starts to think about technology, not as a standalone, but really as, um, you know, I was flip it, it's not a vertical anymore. It's really a horizontal that cuts across every single program. And in particular with COVID, I think we've seen the, the challenges that we have as, as states, as cities in handling a pandemic 
when we don't have, as Kelly's described, the data infrastructure or the technology capacity. I mean, on the on the consumer side of things, um, if you think about you know how people are working from home, you know students accessing um, school, um, that capacity is is has really been stretched and is very limited in many in many cities, um, large and and medium and small. And um, and then you know obviously the infrastructure within the city um, and the governance body to actually provide those services is also really limited. So um, I'm hopeful and I'm still waiting for um, you know an administration that really says you know this is 2020 and we need to all be digital and that requires really investing in technology not as a not as a standalone thing but really as part of, you know part and parcel of providing public service. Yeah. So. When we, as we get sort of in, that we still don't have. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, something I'm thinking about, and I'm sure everyone in every city is thinking about sort of like the idea that COVID is going to be particularly terrible during the winter time. So as we're sort of like thinking about these sort of like this clear upcoming challenge that we're going to have in cities, Kelly, I liked your point about how data just doesn't seem to be related to sort of public health issues. So what are sort of ways that you're considering the broader analytical picture? How can that sort of serve to address everything from sort of schools to the food and security point? How, just, I think it'd be helpful to elucidate sort of the picture there. Yeah, so there's a, a couple different frames. Um, I think one, you know, uh, especially for this audience listening in, we have a pretty strong cohort of actually volunteers that have delved into uh, the analytics and tech space to help service local governments. Um, for those of you not familiar, some of those organizations like the United States Digital Response Group um, started up by folks who are connected with Code for America. Um, I, I feel like this infrastructure has been stood up again and again through the years with different emergencies over time. Um, but this time it's it's kind of grown up and I've seen a lot more concreteness in terms of how they partner with local jurisdictions, um, even though you have a lot of folks that are full-time employees working at different companies saying, I'm, I'm here, I volunteer to really help support what my local community may need that may not immediately have the capacity to be able to do that. Um, and that brings me to my second point, which is that you know, when it's blue skies in New York City, I run around saying like we should be investing in more data scientists and bringing on more uh, analytical talent. And the city of New York has done a ton of work. It, you know, I've only been here for two years and, and one month. So there's a, a lot of work that predates me. And what agencies have been doing is building up their own data teams. So my team, we're a small nimble team of 10. You think of like, we could never be tech, deep technical experts in how parks work or how the fire department works or how the envir environmental protection team works. Uh, and so what's been really neat for us is to watch the, the springing up of different uh, offices and agencies at those mm -hmm. various departments. And I think a li Lillian, I know we've had many discussions that our colleagues uh, have as well. This totally depends on the jurisdiction. Um, there's some jurisdictions that used to work for the city of Boston. We had one data team, you know, 20, 20 odd of us. Uh, we managed a lot of the data assets for the whole city. Here in New York City, and I'm trying not to be very uh, New York City exceptionalism here, um, we have 300,000 employees uh, and uh, manage to uh, provide education for 1.1 million school kids each year, uh, K through 12. So it's a little bit of a different ball game that I don't just think about uh, how does Moda, how does my team support capacity, but I am increasingly think about how can we actually leverage uh, additional um, uh, resources and, and other places to go. And the, the last thing I'll say here is that Marshall, we in July uh, at Moda, we launched something called the New York City Recovery Data Partnership. Um, and I encourage folks to go take a look. It's nyc.gov slash recovery data, one word. And again, this is me trying to figure out with a group of folks, how do we leverage private sector support, external support? And so what we're getting is a lot of data actually streamed into the city for analysis purposes. So LinkedIn and how we're doing uh, jobs wise, workforce wise, uh, Zillow's New York City brand, Street Easy, how are we doing when it comes to the rental market and housing here? Um, I continue to think about our analysis teams at agencies. 
they do such a great job, but data, you know, it very much is a platitude at this point. Data really is fuel for us. If we don't have it, uh, we oftentimes can't actually derive uh, a lot of these insights. Um, and so a lot of our work continues to be figuring out what are the additional pieces of information that we need in order to deliver better analysis uh, for the city. So those are a couple thoughts from me, but yeah, Lillian, love to, to hear from you. Um, no, I mean, I think what I, the, the only thing that sort of just comes to mind um, is, you know, as Kelly said, you know, 10 to 300,000 employees is quite a, that's quite a load to bear. And yet, you know, in a lot of ways, you're actually one of the most, you know, um, resource rich, you know, analytic groups in the country. And yep. so I think, again, I'll just hammer the point that at least from a public sector perspective, which I sort of can hammer now that I that I'm not in it, it's like we have, but I love and I love to do it. That's why I love my job is like just hammering the point that like, I don't think we're really treating these teams in the way that they need to be treated in the way that they can be uh, resourced in order to be effective and you know nothing like a like this pandemic to kind of start to really beg the question like why can't we do contact tracing and like a, a you know in like a really smart and effective way and I think part of it is we're not really staffed or resourced in that way you know one thing that's missing from a lot of these teams is something like um, you know uh, someone who is sort of a legal expert and can understand questions around privacy that like we, we don't even get to unearth or or scratch those issues in the public sector because we're just sort of doing the best we can with you know teams that are greatly outnumbered by the the amount of demand or or um, or activity that's happening around them. And so um, so so I, I again I think it's for the audience that you know it's like we want cities to be smarter, but I do think uh, thinking of ways of partnering with agencies like Kelly's and the work that she's doing uh, around the recovery. I've seen it, 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 you know, it's amazing. Those are the kinds of things we need to start thinking about. The US Digital Service uh, response team is also, I, I think, you know, the more that we can support those kinds of, of programs, because you do have these amazing public servants who just are just outnumbered and there's no way that they can really tackle the kinds of issues that we're facing in cities with the with the tech infrastructure and the, and the, cap and the human capital that we have. Yeah, so as we're discussing this, the immediate thought that comes to mind is could you all speak to what all these issues just sort of felt like back in March because I was I was in New York literally the last weekend before everything basically sort of locked down I'm in DC now and I'm just sort of you know at Lincoln we had to struggle with converting everything to zoom meetings and that was like awkward but straightforward but just what was it like just being in this space um, the city space during this sort of period um, that's just uh, it seems vivid. <laughs> Uh, sh sure, I can start. I, it, Marshall didn't think that I would go back uh, in, in history in my mind uh, that far back, uh, at least for this conversation. But, um, you know, it was in one way we were feeling, I think for anyone in local government, feeling the same thing everyone was feeling, which was like, you know, trying to understand what was going on uh, and trying to understand what the local uh, guidance was um, at the time. And then also being kind of this public servant that everyone in your life was like asking you what mm -hmm. the actual guidance mm -hmm. was um, uh, at the same time. I will say, you know, this is more of just a, a personal uh, statement. Um, being able to work on something meaningful in the midst of, of all of this um, and not just, you know, in March, but all the way through now uh, is one of the great, uh, I think privileges of, of being a public servant. Um, and I think for my team and I, that meant uh, we were on call 24 seven. I mean, certainly I think I've gotten like a lot more wrinkles and, and a couple more white hair since, uh, since March and my poor team has as well. Um, but we were on call because we really didn't know what uh, analysis needs were. Everything required a very quick turnaround. I think our usual pace that we work at is already pretty fast, the clip within the mayor's office of data analytics. Um, you know, we turn stuff around, we can do it in a day or two, a week. Uh, and it, all of a sudden it was like, no, we need that. Like, can you do that in the hour? Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a briefing that's going to the mayor or the emergency management um, commissioner is, is sending out a report. Um, and so that kind of 
a most relentless pace of analysis needed um, was not just true of here in New York City, but true across the country. And so I, I certainly can't speak for like every single data team out there. I just know that there's a lot of public servants in a lot of municipalities um, who don't get the like great privilege I do and like Lillian does of getting here and like talking to all of you about our, our various teams work. But like everything that we were asked of how many um, N95 masks are there in the city across um, all of the agencies across the hospitals, expired, not expired, sizes of those masks, surgical, like I learned way more about masks, I think in 24 hours than I ever thought I would working this job. Um, these are the types of questions that your data professionals who are also public servants were grappling with at the very start. Um, and I think what was really humbling and always is humbling about the work is that we oftentimes don't have the answers. I, I, I oftentimes were asked the questions like, can you do this? I was like, no. They're like, why? I was like, you don't, we don't literally don't have any of that data. My guess is, is as good as yours. Um, and I think even for myself, where I have very much a, a bar for delivery, right? Our, our quality, our assuredness around a certain analysis early on, that was really tough. Like sometimes we didn't meet that bar, but we could not deliver anything. We had to mm -hmm. deliver something. And I think that was oftentimes uh, a lot of the discussions and reconciliations was explaining always, I have 20,000 caveats to what we're going to deliver, but this is better than you guys having nothing about what it is operationally that uh, you're trying to understand. Um, and I think, again, I, as I was talking about earlier with all these different city agencies uh, across the city also all having their own data teams, we were not alone. We also worked in very close partnership with other city agency offices who were also 24 seven um, because their commissioners and, and their teams also needed um, very, very fast turnaround analysis. I don't know, Lillian, did you actually miss, <laughs> did you actually miss being in the midst, middle of, of all of this uh, as, as you were looking on from night? I, I sort of did to the point that you made like when you started, which is that I think it, it was such a crazy moment and you didn't know, right? There was this moment where we were like, what's gonna happen? You know, who, how, you know, especially as toilet paper was running out and there were long lines at Costco and stuff and you're just like, and um, and I th and then I just kept thinking like what I would have to be doing if I was in um, in, in, in a different role. And, and there was a part of me that wanted to actually like be, be helpful and be not just trying to figure out where I could find, you know, where I could find groceries or where I could find, you know, the things, the essentials that we were looking for. I'm like, oh, I'd rather be doing that. So there's a part of me that was that, but, um, but you know, what was a couple of interesting observations, you know, in this role, I get to now work with cities and, and work on issues beyond data under sort of like the smart cities umbrella. And what was really fascinating and slightly optimistic, I think, um, the demand for 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 the services of these teams is really great and and one comment that i heard and i saw across different cities was that you know oftentimes innovation teams data teams they're really seen as like a nice luxury kind of benefit to have and all of a sudden these individuals these you know very capable you know smart bright individuals in these roles were being actually put on the front lines of a lot of the work that's happening and that was actually, and that's in some ways, I remember having this conversation with someone like, that's actually also a monumental shift because you have to remember that, you know, a lot of these public agencies are really driven by mm -hmm. policy and legislation. And so usually, you know, the, the data geeks, um, you know, it's like, you know, we're not allowed oftentimes in those spaces. And all of a sudden, like here, there's a really great opportunity where cities were in need. And a lot of these innovation teams were the ones who actually, these data innovation teams were the ones who were actually um, answering the call. So that's actually really optimistic. And then the other thing was, I mean, just, um, we've been talking about um, cities going digital. And it was interesting how this one moment actually like four cities to be much more digital than like 10, 15 years of, of folks advocating that cities had to be more digital. And so that just willingness and that openness to like make services go online and go into forms where, again, a lot of teams really have to collaborate, but push and nudge departments along to make these things not in-person processes. A lot of that just went away in, in one day, obviously. 
um, or in a series of days. And it was really remarkable to see how easily the city shifted and then how open a lot of these departments were because it was it was either going digital or actually, um, you know, being in a relevant service. And, and that's a whole other kind of trail of conversation we can have. But. Yeah, of course. Um, so speaking a little more towards the title of the event, obviously the audience here is sort of in the, the technologist people in sort of the tech community and the sort of obvious conventional wisdom is that every company and their cousin is having to think seriously about sort of the future of cities and whether this is the place where it makes sense to locate. So can you all just sort of speak at a sort of from a data analytics analytical level, but also sort of a personal level because your lives are obviously immersed in a professional level in cities. Could you speak to the set of trade-offs and choices that companies and technologists are having to think about when they think like, should I focus from row only? Is there still a value in being in a place like New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco? Can you all speak to that? Um, Kelly, first, please. Uh, well, I think I can, maybe I can speak, I, I, this is dangerous territory. I'll speak on behalf of uh, New York City and, and Los Angeles and say that the like global and national desire to live and work and like be in these cities, um, like I don't think that's gonna subside. Like there are many people who would love to live, myself included one day in, in LA, maybe when I retire from this job. Um, <laughs> But to to really be focused in these cities, and I think um, uh, you know very specifically recently that when you think about urban density and a lot of the studies that uh, really demonstrate the connections between urban density and innovation, I think about that a lot. That there's still a lot of this physicality and and like closeness of people together that brings together here in New York City or, or in LA and our other places, let's say, you know, an arts and culture scene that is very, very different than um, other jurisdictions uh, throughout the country. And so I, I still continue to think about that uh, in the back of my head around all of these different industries that have sprung up. I'm sure you guys have been paying attention that Broadway will continue to stay closed here in New York City, at least for the foreseeable future into 2021. Um, but I just think about a lot of these intangibles that have to do with the closeness of people together uh, in, in different spaces and the fact that the demand to live in New York City, despite what you may read in the Times or other, uh, other outlets over the last eight months, uh, that demand has, has not subsided um, I do think that the flexibility, uh, you know, that um, you know, myself, I've had to be working remotely. That's been the protocol here since March for all of us. Um, I, I do think that that has shifted people's uh, thinking, maybe not so much like I'm moving to Vermont necessarily or, or moving to somewhere much more uh, rural. But I think what's really interesting for this group is potentially folks who are more interested in moving to mid-sized cities um, and still getting that balance of uh, large city feel, but let's say like actually a backyard because I'm here in New York <laughs> City um, or, or other treats that one could have um, if you had a little bit more space. So I, I do think that that's, that's a big piece um, that I've been thinking through. And certainly for us, it's always, Lillian knows this, it's always so hard to recruit but it's a lot easier to recruit in New York City because people want to live here. They want to be a public servant and people love being public servants here in New York City um, because you get to make a difference. Um, Marshall, this used to be my pitch in DC as well, right? You get to live in a city, you get to do good, you get to help yeah. the country or, or help the local jurisdiction. Um, but I do think about that now where uh, I, I don't know how cities are, are gonna adapt if this continues on. Um, you know, will, will I be having staff that are, you know, out there in, in Missouri, but like actually working here in, in New York City, um, uh, residency uh, and, and union rules to the side. I do think about that a lot is that all of a sudden the, the hiring uh, ability here for governments has expanded a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot, a lot of structural mm -hmm. questions, I think, still yeah. on the horizon here. Yeah, we've seen, um, tonight does this really interesting um, report one of our other theories of investment in the communities program at Knight Foundation is um, around public spaces. And so we do a lot of um, surveying about how you create attachment to place. That's kind of just one of our natural questions that we ask. And I think 
um, to Kelly's point about the arts and culture, um, we had just recently done the, um, the, the, the survey around communities and attachment, and that consistently comes up as a huge thing. So I think this, a city's ability to retain that workforce is really gonna depend a lot on its ability to invest in public spaces and in arts and the culture in the city. Those are the things that actually create attachment, less so than employment um, um, or some of those other kind of um, related or like sub suburban quality of life kinds of issues. It's really a lot of these kind of more cultural um, uh, things that attach people to place. That being said, the one danger is Oftentimes, especially as we head into the aftermath of COVID with um, budget deficits in many cities, those are the first things that tend to get cut, right? Like not a lot of people are investing in, in parks and green space, although maybe because of the use of it in this pandemic and, and the emergency, we're, we're hopeful that they will. Um, and obviously the arts um, and cultural institutions have been just unfortunately um, you know, really hurt by this by this pandemic. So, um, so I think the question is still out. I also don't personally think a lot of people are moving from LA into, like, I've, I've been trying to think about what our equivalent to Vermont is in Los Angeles, and that there just isn't one. Um, maybe like Arizona or Nevada, but I just I don't I don't know that I totally see it um, happening. And um, but if it does, it's really going to depend on the city's ability to retain things like arts and culture and public spaces. Um, and then lastly, I do agree with the point and some colleagues of mine, uh, again, in the communities program see this more. I think what we're seeing is people shifting from larger cities to maybe smaller and mid-sized cities. So a lot of folks talk about people from New York moving to Miami, actually. That's been apparently um, a, a migration pattern that we're seeing a lot more. It's not just the, the, the snowbirds or the, the, the winter bird folks the retirees who moved down south for the colder for the for the, the hotter weather it's, it's younger people um who, who choose to um who are, who are having flexibility and choosing to move so you might see more mid-size large to mid-size or mid-size to mid-size market movement but i don't think you're going to see like city to rural I, mean, I don't know i just that's a personal that's a that's sort of my just personal point of view i don't know that i have hard data on that one yeah, I mean, we're, this is the part which we're all sort of figuring out, so I'm not sure there is any relevant data. Um, so speaking of sort of data and the original sort of analytical picture, Kelly, I'm curious, what has been something that's emerged from your work that's just honestly surprised you, um, given, because what's been difficult about COVID is we're all trying to write narratives as we sort of go, but what's interesting is that obviously, given the intersectional nature of your work, I'm sure you found information that sort of gone against whatever that wisdom was? Uh, I'm like, Marshall, so many things have surprised me, but uh, let me yeah. try to articulate <laughs> something for the <laughs> end of the day here for, for you all from the East Coast. Um, I think maybe not, I'm trying to think if this is the, the right needle to thread uh, here at the end of the day for you all. I, you know, I have approached data and analytics and always thought about our work not in a silo but we oftentimes do end up in a silo so what happens lillian alluded to this earlier is that technologists or data scientists or whomever your analysts are kind of separated from um, the decision makers right and we all know that when that happens when you're building the programs or you're delivering the analysis enough games of telephone happen that things get lost in between. And I think what's been really surprising over the last couple of years is that I haven't actually seen the policy operations decision-making space collapse with data and analytics as much as it should have. Because in the private sector, the data people are everything. They tell you your bottom line. They they are delivering the reports to the CEO. They're the ones, you know, delivering the financial reports every quarter to the uh, public. And I, I was surprised, I think, at the beginning, just how quickly, to Lillian's point around us all working remotely, as as another example, just how quickly that just just all collapsed. Like I, I was on phone calls with people. My team, data scientists, were talking to people at executive levels. Not to say that we hadn't before, but a lot of those barriers had just, they just disappeared as if they didn't exist 
you know, a couple months before. And I'm really excited to see hopefully that to continue. Like we're definitely already starting to see that people are now just picking up the phone and, and calling us directly. And I think part of that is is on us. I, you know, I realize even when I'm chatting with you all here that enough years of working in data and, and analysis, I have enough meetings with uh, quote unquote lay people <laughs> who are like, I don't understand a single thing you just said. Like I've just delivered something in a very um, analytical or very wonky way. And so, you know, surprised to see those barriers fall down. Uh, still a lot of ways to go. Like still people call us, call us before you decide to do the program because we need to tell you how to measure the program, <laughs> please. Um, uh, and certainly not just here in New York City, but elsewhere as well. Like seeing a lot of data teams being elevated to positions working more closely with executives and being more closely tied in with, with decision making. So I think uh, out of many, many surprises, there'll be story time, I'm sure, separately, uh, which are other surprises, I, I think, structurally that have happened uh, through the analysis. But yeah, th this one in particular, to see those walls collapse between policy decision makers and, and the data teams has been a pretty significant one. So my last question that um, I'll ask separately to both of you, um, Lillian, Obviously, Knight leads investments in a bunch of sort of different areas. So where are, what are some spaces in this sort of data analytics sort of post-COVID city space that, where, what are areas, opportunity areas that you're interested in? And then Kelly, from your perspective, what are areas that you think people like Lillian should be sort of delving into on a deeper sort of level um, from, and there's, that isn't just foundations, that's sort of people in university settings, researchers, et cetera. So Lillian, I'll start with you. Uh, you muted yourself. Ah, sorry. Um, interestingly enough, um, even uh, slightly nope. prior before COVID, uh, we started. Oh, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Owen. Okay, oh, we're back. We're, okay. we're good. No. We're uh, no. Man, we were I so think... close. I'm sorry, uh, Lillian. I still can't hear you. <laughs> I, Marshall, can you hear me? I can hear Lillian. I could. Oh, okay. I can hear you. Okay. Oh. So, Pretend yeah, I'm not I can, here. I can hear both of you. <laughs> so sorry, Lillian, ignore no, me. Yeah, Kelly, please just take over. No, um, okay. So I was I was saying, um, and hopefully you can hear Marshall, that um, you know, slightly before the pandemic, we actually had decided to focus a bit more on data. Um, and, and focus on this issue of data as we call it accessibility. And I think post-COVID, in a lot of ways, it, it sort of reinforced the point. Um, and what we mean by data accessibility is the idea that, you know, a lot of these programs and a lot of the information is important to house inside, you know, these um, city entities and, and it's important to manage um, and build up their capacity. But at the same time, we also have to build greater demand for this kind of information from the public and create sort of a greater public expectation that our government agencies can do more with data. And that's not really going to happen until the data and the information really becomes truly accessible in the sense that it doesn't require you to be some analytics, you know, expert or some data scientist to really understand it. And so, you know, how so for us, it's investing in ways to um, to um, visualize information. It's investing in ways to push data out into other services. That make the that make the data more consumable by the public, more accessible. Um, and again, we're hoping in a lot of ways that then we're um, we're showing the value of data, increasing the demand from the outside, and then hopefully um, putting um, you know greater uh, positive pressure on the institution to invest more in its own data capacity. So that's um, that's in a nutshell what we had sort of already the path we were already down. Um, and then we were really, um, when COVID hit, kind of feeling like, um, you know, I think it sort of reinforced the need that data is important, data to the public is important, um, and and the ways that we share information with data, in, in particular with the public, is, is really critical because I think as we're seeing, I think, you know, a lot of the sentiment around COVID, around mask wearing, around whether this is real or not, has to do a lot with how people um, are seeing this information presented to them and or not and, and getting confused and or being sidetracked by other um, efforts out there. So um, so that, that public accessibility of data is, is the key for us. 
Well, I think Lillian, you perfect tee up uh, for me because I think <laughs> exactly to to your point around um, uh, data accessibility. You know, when I think about early days, the Johns Hopkins dashboard that got stood up was everyone was just like, someone has built something. Let's all let's all model after that. And I, when I think about um, government in particular, maybe we just lost Marshall there. Um, but when I think about government in particular building data products, building things that are replicable, that other jurisdictions start to adopt. Uh, I think that is one of the key uh, key pieces here that we want um, funders, investment to continue to help spur that type of innovation so that it can really seed what government uh, is, is working on and, and looking toward. Um, and then I think in terms of specifics, you know, I, maybe we'll delve just quickly into two different types of uh, data um, that I think are have always been critically important, but even that much more so. One is mobility data. Lillian, know this, mobility has always been uh, really important to uh, governments, but certainly around social distancing, certainly around um, a lot of the restrictions of moving into and out of cities, uh, as well as just us wanting to know, let's say the tax base, and if they're actually departing and moving uh, to Florida from New York City, these are all really, really helpful external data sets to be able to understand, of course, like use responsibly. There are huge data privacy questions and concerns um, around any entity's usage of that data, especially it's, it's your data, right? Uh, coming from, from your cell phone. Um, so mobility is one big bucket. And then the other big one is jobs, jobs, jobs. Like I will sound like every mm -hmm. local elected out there. Uh, workforce data, the uh, loss of jobs in certain sectors. You know, we, we've had a lot of this discussion with LinkedIn in particular and their economic graph uh, team and we're receiving LinkedIn data. But you can take a look to see what are the job titles uh, that have decreased and uh, actually shifted from those job titles into other industries. So to actually watch which jobs um, people have uh, actually left and gone into, whether that's food delivery or uh, healthcare, has been really fascinating to, to mm -hmm. see. And then I think as more data emerges around what companies are trying to hire for, that should really hopefully help how governments uh, and funders think about investing in workforce development, right? Like you should, you should be training up people with these certain skills uh, now that there's more demand uh, in, in these certain industries and in these job titles as well. So th those two, I think uh, I am really hopeful. There's been some movement across uh, different programs and different jurisdictions thinking about that, certainly here in, in New York City as well. Great. Well, Kelly and Lillian, thank you so much. This has been incredibly helpful. Um, so we, we are at time. Um, so thank you to everyone who attended this talk. And I'm sure you should follow Kelly and Lillian's work in this space. There's plenty of exciting things to come. So thank you so much. Of course. Thanks for having us.